the Trinity Sunday Collect, Almighty and Everlasting God, who hast given unto us thy servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities who livest and reignest one God, world without end. Amen. Easter hymn 208, verse 5. Lord, by the stripes which wounded thee, from death's dread sting thy servants free, that we may live and sing to thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We now turn to Dr. James Gardner's Lollardy and the Reformation in England. <clears throat> we'll say this, volume one. We'll see if he gets into Lollardy. But volume two, so far, nothing there. It's basically a review of the English Reformation. Now, the title is Lollardy and the English Re and the Reformation in England. But is it more English Reformation? Is it half and half, Lollardy and the English Reformation? So that's volume one and two so far, and we're starting volume three here. The other two volumes, one and two, were published in 1908. This, 19, this volume three is published in 1911, coming from the University of Dad's alma mater, University of Toronto. The contents, book five, Juvenile Supremacy. <laughs> Chapter one, beginning of the protectorate. Chapter two, progress of innovation. Three, England, Trent, and the interim. Book four, Lollardy in power. That's interesting. Chapter one, Warwick, Gardner, and Cranmer. Two, the Episcopal Revolution and Bishop Hooper. Three, destroying the altars of Baal. Four, the great conspiracy. Well, first time we've seen Lollardy in one of the book titles. Introduction, continuing this work on Lollardy and the Reformation, I feel that its scope and object now deserves fuller explanation, first of all, though there are other reasons, because we seldom hear historians speak of Lollardy after Henry VIII's time. And they are right in not using a term which was no longer much used by contemporaries. For as I have shown already, it was unbecoming to talk of Lollards or Lollardy when the spirit of Lollardy had grown so influential and so useful to those in power. A new name had been invented for what was essentially an old thing. The new learning, indeed, was a name that even its votaries did not accept at first quite readily. We've got a long footnote here. Who is there, says George Constantine in 1539, who is there almost that will have a Bible, but he must be compelled thereto? How loath be our priests to teach the commandments, the articles of the faith, and the paternoster in English. Again, how unwilling be the people to learn it. Yea, they jest at it, calling it the new paternoster and the new learning. So also Latimer resents the expression, but ye say it is new learning. Now I tell you, it is old learning. Ye say it is an old heresy now scoured. Nay, I tell you, it is old truth, long rusted with your canker, and now new, new made bright and scoured. Latimer's Sermons, Parker Society, page 30. Many other examples of the expression might be given, 
but perhaps the most significant are those which occur in Cranmer's letter of reproof to an influential justice of Kent, perhaps Thomas Shaney, warden of the Cinque Ports, or Cinque Ports, who disliked the new school and claimed the newly published institution of a Christian man as a rebuke to the innovators. Cranmer had heard that he had said of it, quote, it alloweth all the old fashion and putteth all the knaves of the new learning to silence, close quote. He had thus, Cranmer tells him, discouraged the teachers of the New Testament and had led his servants to say to them, my master and divers other could have favored you much better, saving that you smelled of the new learning. Back to the narrative of Professor Gardner. But they soon acquiesced in the use of a term which Cranmer himself could not help employing to denote were both his principles and theirs. Old Lollardy, in short, having helped Henry VIII to put down the Pope and having been unmuzzled for that very purpose, could not but get its own way. In some things with the king's powerful protection, but it must not be called lollardy or heresy anymore. It was a new learning, different from that of the schools, for which the king and Cranmer bespoke a fair hearing. Under Edward the Sixth, therefore, and also under Elizabeth, we have to see how this new learning comported itself, having authority so much in its favor. To make this apparent is the task that lies before me, and I must own it is a formidable one for the demands it makes upon my poor energies. Moreover, when I look back on the work already accomplished, I am almost disheartened by a sense of its defects. Of these, in some ways, I felt conscious beforehand, but I must frankly own that detached and fragmentary as its very plan was, there is a good deal in the execution of my work that requires apology. Not only are large subjects slightly treated, but there is a larger crop of errors than I like the look of. Nor am I desirous that what I have already written should be more highly esteemed than it deserves for I find that my very errors when pointed out, as some of them are, have been, were real hindrances to my general aim, while on the other hand there are popular but misdirected criticisms which require a word or two in explanation. If indeed anyone were to accuse me of great presumption in having attempted to grapple with so large a subject at all, I might well feel at loss to answer him, for I knew from the first that I labored under no small disadvantage for one who would fain have treated as a whole a subject of such magnitude with so many ramifications. I was a mere retired archivist most of whose official time had been occupied in endeavoring to chronologize and arrange matter for real historians to use. But I felt at the same time that my somewhat special experience, not due to my own choice, had given me the command of what I certainly consider the most important aspect of that great political and religious crisis, which we are in the habit of calling the Reformation, and that to estimate its historical significance or right requires a good deal more than the wholehearted devotion which many can give to a very good cause, even when that devotion is animated by the utmost desire to be impartial. 
for it requires first a clearer apprehension than it is easy to form in these days of the political status of the church in the Reformation times. And secondly, a no less clear appreciation of the political legacy of thoughts and feelings bequeathed to both parties by the Reformation philosophy. From these factors, indeed, emerged the contest between the high and low church principles and ultimately with the principles of dissent, which have troubled the Church of England from the Reformation to the present day. A full treatment of all this vast subject is, I confess, altogether beyond me. Indeed, I never pretended to consider or wish the reader to consider my historical survey as a full church history of any period. But I have done what I could hitherto, merely in the way of sketches, to illuminate the main conditions under which the Reformation was evolved. And I am anxious, if possible, to continue the story still in the same fashion to the same time when something like a settled basis was attained. That is to say, when liberated from serious external danger, the Reformed Church had really become the church of the people at large. Now, what is the problem to be faced? Let any intelligent man ask himself one question. Is there not something yet to be explained as to the actual cause or causes of the Reformation, or its significance of its significance, no one can entertain a doubt. Whether looked upon as a good or evil thing for religion, all must confess that it was a very great thing. Some mighty power shook the heavens and the earth. It is hardly possible for us now to picture to our imaginations the heavens and the earth that passed away centuries ago. History has become vivid since then. Before the 16th century, we see it as in a glass darkly. Surely this is a problem for an historian, if indeed any of us who have all our ingrained prejudice prejudices can but lift himself, even for a moment, out of the narrowing tendencies of the school in which he has been brought up. Yet the world is so divided now into different schools and different communions that it is no wonder if some great thinkers and even historians have sought impartiality in unbelief and rejected Christianity altogether from the inability to see it as a whole. For no doubt there is a sort of impartiality in paganism, though it persecuted Christianity itself in days of old. But it is a strange thing to make oneself a pagan now after centuries of Christian teaching. It does not help us to understand what life is that a man should have intellect cold as a glacier. We are affected by Christianity whether we will or not. There is no resisting the power which carries on the work of civilization. Yet we do not to this day see it clearly and cold intellects are of no help. Often, where there is the least of dogma, there is most of heart, and the heart is wiser than the head. For my own part, I, if I have my prejudices, I do not think they are such as some of my readers imagine. I have never felt the least personal inclination towards the Church of Rome, though I confess I have always desired to understand it but I have always desired to understand other religions too. For 
for I myself was brought up outside of all the orthodoxies and for half my life, what I now feel to be the vital doctrines of Christianity, acknowledged all the world over, were certainly quite unintelligible to me and accordingly incredible. Moreover, when in former days I read discussions between Orthodox Protestants and Romanists, I must confess that as one outside either community, I almost always felt that the Romanist had the better of his antagonist in point of logic. Nevertheless, Rome was further removed from me a great deal than Protestantism. And if, as some critics have pointed out to me, I have done the Roman cause historically rather than justice, it has arisen from a desire to be fair in matters easily exaggerated by our modern prejudices. But on this subject, I will say a few words by and by. For criticisms of another kind must first be disposed of, especially as they are criticisms which have a deeper root in popular feeling. Indeed, they are founded on views so specious that they completely obscure, to my mind, the real story of the English Reformation. And it is the one great object which I propose to myself when I began the present work to ascertain as far as possible the essential principles of that mighty movement which has given it such permanence and strength. Of course, many will say that these were theological principles such as justification by faith or the negation of purgatory and transubstantiation I am the last man to deny the importance, the supreme importance, I would say, to each one of us of having true and not a false theology to guide him, without which the individual soul must inevitably be perishing everlastingly. But the individual is not a church to himself. When it comes to that, of course, he can do that, he can do without any church at all in a land of perfect toleration. For in fact, he has then. He has no religion whatever and does not want any. Real religion should draw men into social unity. How can it otherwise when men feel that they have one common master? Interject here, sounds very von Harnackian. And shows little evidence of Old and New Testament exegesis or systematic theology, which we bring in and is floating in the background. We return to the narrative. And the question has always been, both before the Reformation and since, how to preserve that social unity, formed not by political or human power, but by God's own spirit in our hearts, with all due, but not overdue, submission to the powers that be. <clears throat> Opinions differ, no doubt they will, as they always have done. <clears throat> but if there be anything in one's opinion at all, is it the better for being segregated or confined to a few who claim the right of worshiping by themselves? Whatever the errors of our ancestors and their ways were certainly too forcible, they never imagined that. The individual or the sect must be fruitful in the nature of things until he or they take part somehow in the spiritual life of those about them. 
and how far the prejudices of society will admit of that is doubtless a troublesome question. Far easier it seems to most of us to say, leave me alone and I will leave you alone. Nay, if the principle of division is held sacred, we must say so sometimes in our own defense. But it is not a miserable thing that Christianity should be walled up in compartments thus. We are very liberal in these days towards sects, not merely to the men who belong to sects, but to the sects themselves. Churchmen are often anxious to recognize these bodies as separate bodies from themselves, having just as much a right to exist, not merely a legal right which is conceded, but a moral and spiritual right to be separate communities. But this claim is fatal to the essence of Christianity itself. We are liberal enough in a sort of way. Among our intimate friends, we have churchmen, Roman Catholics, dissenters, agnostics, Jews, and perhaps Mohammedans. We walk with them, talk with them, eat with them, drink with them. There is only one common table to which we cannot come. Even those of us who profess Christianity, and that is the Lord's table. We must tolerate differences, and I do not deny that we are right in doing so. But how do differences come? Surely, because we are, as St. Paul said, carnal. That is to say, not entirely Christian. Otherwise, we might confer on these matters in the matter of unity, just as we do in secular matters. But the present day problems do not appeal to us here. The question is how to look at matters in the 16th century. The late Canon Big, I'm gonna make a note here. Wayside, wayside Sketches. I'm writing my thing here in ecclesiastical history. Expresses his regret that I and the late Canon Dixon agree in the use of the word heretic in its strictly historical sense. That is to say, we call those persons heretics who were called heretics by their contemporaries. Well, I should say for my part, that if we wish to understand past ages, we must learn a little of the language of past ages and try and understand what it means. We shall never truly appreciate the ideas of our ancestors if we do not weigh their words. And I do not see how we are to understand their words if we presume that they continually misapplied them. They surely had some reason for calling heresy that which they did call heresy. And though, of course, as compared with ourselves, they were very ignorant in many things, yet on the whole, they knew what they meant by the words they used just as well as we do. But it is true that a great change of feeling has taken place with regard to heresy, and that we regard it now as something very harmless. This is sufficiently manifest in the way that Canon Big condemns my use of the language of ancient times. Quote, if everybody is to bear the name which his contemporaries give him, close quote, Canon Dixon was, and Mr. Gardner is, a heretic, anathematized by such the majority of the Christian world. They would have found themselves burnt alive by the same men who sent Thomas Bilney to the stake. 
these early English Protestants did not hold one single belief which is not held or regarded as tenable amongst us at the present day. Further, it is not the want of history to fix upon parties the nicknames by which they have been branded by theological or political hatred, close quote. Nicknames, he's got an exclamation point. <clears throat> the word heretic occurs in the New Testament. Did St. Paul use it as a nickname? A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Titus 3.10. Perhaps the meaning is rather better expressed in the Vulgate, in which the text was read long ago, hereticum hominum, post unum et secundum correctum, correctionum, correptionum divita. After two separate admonitions to the heretic, avoid his company, says St. Paul, giving a reason for this advice in the next verse. Knowing that he it, that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. For example, he is a perverse man and stands self-condemned as a wrongdoer. Now this is just what heretics were considered to be in the Middle Ages. Even if popular opinion was to some extent affected by prejudice, mid medieval Christians acted just as St. Paul advised. They avoided the company of men. Where did I? I'm marked as heretics whenever it was found that they could not be affected by admonitions. And the church, when it failed to reconcile them, cast them off by excommunication that they might not contaminate others. That was the utmost that the church could do to them. And no one could treat another as an irreclaimable heretic until the church had pronounced judgment upon him to that effect. Unhappily, matters did not stop there, and it is difficult to see in rough times how they could have stopped there. No one will think of justifying nowadays a penalty such as burning, and certainly it was a most objectionable thing. And here we must bring to a close our work on Volume 3, Professor James Gardner's Lollardy in the English Reformation, in which he has explained his own perspective of trying to understand Romanism and Protestantism and being unaffected by it in his early years. And yet it sounds like he had a conversion experience. And now he's explaining the use of the word heretic in Paul's epistle to Titus. Well, Easter hymn 209, verse 1. We walk by faith and not by sight. <clears throat> no gracious words we hear from him who spoke as none e'er spoke but we believe him near. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.